So before Oklahoma and Texas, the Oklahoma State Cowboys and the Baylor Bears were offered to join your mega league? Not them. The Dallas Cowboys and the Chicago Bears. Hi everyone, this is Will O'Toole welcoming you to another edition of Park Ridge Sports History. This week, I'd like to talk about the recent membership of two big traditional football powerhouses from the Big 12, the Texas Longhorns and the Oklahoma Sooners, and what it is going to do for the landscape of college football. And it is, I'm telling you right now, it is a it's it's got a higher Richter scale uh, on the off the charts than occurred in Alaska this weekend, where they had an 8.2 measured earthquake. I mean, this is really a earth shattering development in college football, and I don't know whether because it's summer or because it's college sports or because it involves a region outside of, let's say, the Northeast that people really haven't picked up on this, except for really college football fans. And I'd like to present maybe a theory and uh, of what I think is going to eventually happen with college sports. And it is going to take on a life of its own. And I think that the SEC the is the one conference that probably has most recognized this. So I'd like to delve into that today and, uh, you know, just talk anything sports. I know that last week I, I spent uh, quite a bit of time talking about the war <laughs> in baseball and how I thought. And, and listen, for all you fans out there, I think I'm a knowledgeable fan. I'm certainly no expert. I don't think there is an expert in anything sports because, hey, listen, uh, there's always something that's going to uh, it's going to get by you or whatever. The war, though, is a confusing stat. And I thought uh, I wanted to bring this up. I mentioned about Orlando Cepeda's 69 stats measured against Ernie Banks's and why I had so much difficulty with the war. And I'll go back to this. But I was not trying to take away from anything that Orlando Cepeda did in 1969. In fact, he's a former MVP, just like Banks was, almost the same age as Banks was in 1969. What I just couldn't understand is they basically had the same stats. Potentially, yes, Cepeda had more uh, assists and maybe put outs at first base. But many times that is a measurement of the pitching staff. Maybe one was more high octane uh, strikeout like the Cubs were, let's say, in 1969, as opposed to more ground ball uh, pitching staff of the Phil Necro-led Atlanta Braves in 69. That being said, I, it just baffles me that a guy who drove in 100 runs and had 20-some-odd home, uh, home runs for the Cubs that year in 69. And yes, he's on the other side of his career. I get all that. Didn't have a lot of speed. Only scored 60 runs. But it's amazing the differential, the really the gap between the wars of Orlando Cepeda, who had fewer RBIs, more home runs, slightly more batting average and, and uh, walks, just just head and head and toes above Banks in terms of his uh, war. And this is not the first guy. In fact, probably in future shows, I will take a look at. Jacob DeGrom against uh, Nola for the Philadelphia Phillies and the contrast in their war in um, when DeGrom won his uh, Cy Young Award, besting uh, the Philadelphia Philly ace who finished second that year. But well, we'll get into that a little bit later. I hope maybe I kind of cleared up. Maybe I clouded many of you in understanding war, but it is in itself just another stat. And it is become kind of a, a a real thorn in my side, the the war and the fact that I, I, I think there are traditional measurements of ball players that maybe scouts and maybe the metrics guys are starting to see again 
and how they are affecting the performances of the players uh, on the field. You know, they real case, real real quick, they always drive home the OPS and that a player has to have a high OPS. Well, how do you get a high OPS? That is on base percentage, which is a combination of batting average and walks hit by pitches. All right. Because you can't have a good. Here's my point. You can't have a good on base percentage unless you have a decent batting average. So it's not just about walks. And I think people are starting to realize, listen, you still got to hit the ball and you got to hit it with consistency. And there aren't too many guys in the Hall of Fame with a 190 batting average who hit 30, 35 home runs in the season. That's the irony of it all. If it was, Dave Kingman really would be in the Hall of Fame. So we'll get into that, Delve. I hope I brought up just interesting things about the 1969 and two Hall of Famers, Banks and Cepeda, very similar and yet very different according to war. Anyway, getting back to what recently happened with Oklahoma and Texas. Now, these are teams that have combined for a number of college football championships. When I was growing up, Texas was the be-all and end-all. Uh, they, they were in the midst of that 30-game winning streak or 30-plus game winning streak. And I'm talking about 69-70. That was uh, Notre Dame tried to put an end to it in the 1970 Cotton Bowl came up short, but the next year they do defeat uh, Texas in the Cotton Bowl. And for, for many years, I, I, I looked at Texas as a big rival uh, for Notre Dame since I, I pulled four and still do pull for the Irish. Although I haven't been happy with them lately. And I'm going to get into that too, because they are definitely affected by this SEC development. Here's where I'm coming from with this SEC. This is a league that has always been dominated by football. It is a football power conference. And I don't think there's anyone going to argue this, that it's probably the premier college football uh, league right now in all of college football. Just take a look at their BCS standings. Just take a look at the number of teams that they put into the postseason. Notice what I'm saying, postseason instead of the college balls. I know there's there's the Burma. You know, that's one that that's missing. I should do a cartoon on that. The Burma Shave Bowl. Wouldn't that be great? And you can have a Burma Shave <laughs> famous saying at <laughs> at the 50 yard line. That would be a great that I'm going to do that. Bowl games I'd love to see. Anyway, the the SEC is really dominated with the exception of Clemson uh, winning it ju just recently. But it, football has become Southern dominated. And I, I'm going to tell you right now, with more with this joining of the two premier powers in the Big 12, I mean, let's face it. Yes, you can say Kansas, but they're basketball. And what really drives college sports today is still the football program. So you are taking, extracting, just like a dentist does, only these aren't bad teeth. These are like your front teeth that really give you your smile. And that's what Texas and Oklahoma have done, both for the Southwest Conference years ago when Texas was part of it and the Big Eight when Oklahoma was part of it, what they have done for college football. You got to remember that I was just uh, alluding to Texas's 30-game winning streak many years ago and a couple of national championships. I mean, Oklahoma had a monstrous winning streak, of course, also ended by the Irish. And they have been a college football power, not just in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, but uh, obviously they won a title. I think the last time they won a title was 2000. So you are talking about a uh, really some football behemoths coming into the SEC. What's that going to do? Well, let's take a look at it from a financial standpoint. First of all, the SEC has its own really network. I know that ESPN is probably a, a, a really the functionary for that. But basically, I love watching uh, Paul Feinbaum on uh, the SEC. He is funny. He's got just a great sense of humor. It's very dry. It just, he does not, he, he, he 
breaks through all the stereotypes of college football fans. Here he is looking like an erudite physics professor, and he's talking all things college football with basically an Eastern accent. Uh, he's really funny. He's incredible with his knowledge, not just of the SEC, but all things college sports. Here's the SEC. So they have a network. Yes, the ACC and the Big Ten also t uh, do too. The SEC basically has a monopoly on Channel 2, uh, CBS Sports. And obviously they're, they're showing, I, I mean, they're 24-7, 365, just like the Big Ten and the ACC, okay? But by grabbing these two, what they're doing is, yes, they are expanding their conference, but they're also expanding their region and their attractiveness to all of the national audience who follows college football. I mean, now you're bringing in 16 teams. Obviously, you're going to have to cut this. You're going to have to divide eight and eight. Obviously, you're going to have a mega postseason playoff game in the SEC. But here's the thing, and this is what people are missing. The South is growing economically in terms of demographics, in terms of popularity. There are more and more people from the Northeast, from the Midwest. Remember, the Rust Belt is called the Rust Belt because of all the manufacturing that has gone south because of lower taxes, better weather, etc. Same thing with the Northeast. Many people are moving into uh, SEC country, Florida, Georgia, and now Texas. And many others are moving into Tennessee. What does Tennessee have? Well, two teams in the Southeast Conference, Vanderbilt, which has just recently won, well, not this year, but they were in the in the championship of baseball. They won the year before. Big stud pitcher that was drafted by the Mets, coming from Vanderbilt. Al Leiter's son playing for Vanderbilt. So they are, let's face it, they're a big-time program in baseball. And maybe baseball isn't football, and maybe baseball isn't college basketball, but these are all things that are adding to everything on the growth spurt for the SEC. I was doing just a little bit of research, and I, I know I started off with college football. I was hoping uh, with the championships, I was hoping to kind of like bring up the other sports, but I was looking through, and I'm just comparing the SEC with the Big Ten because let's face it, and maybe this is a prejudice of mine, but when I was always brought up, College football was really the Big Ten. Everybody always thought of Big Ten football. Yes, Notre Dame, maybe the military academies. And out on the West Coast was USC and UCLA. But USC was the premier team. And then you have all these teams in the South playing football. Let's face it. When everybody thinks of college football, they think of two things. The Big Ten, the Rose Bowl. Who was playing in the Rose Bowl? Always a Big Ten team when I was growing up. Now, that being said, the Big Ten really hasn't been a big player when it's come to college football. Neither has Notre Dame. And they both share one thing in common. They're both from that, you know, Midwestern area. Now, you can say this, the ACC, while it's been dominated by Clemson, yes. But in their league, they also have Miami and Florida State, which were powers in the 80s and 90s. Okay. Maybe they had great coaches and that was a, a reason for it. But they're still going to be players in their respective leagues. I don't know so much about the Big Ten. And the Big Ten always seems to come with problems, with the exception of Ohio State, uh, Wisconsin. Good team. I don't put them in the same echelon as Michigan and Ohio State. They've had some great teams in their past. They've really really improved in the last 20, 30 years. They've become a powerhouse in the uh, in the Big Ten. But I don't really think they've broadened in the same way as Clemson, Alabama, Auburn, LSU, and Georgia. They're a nice fit for the Big Ten. But I don't know whether they could actually compete in the SEC. I mean, listen, and I'm talking about Alabama, uh, Notre Dame, too. If Notre Dame was in the Southeast Conference right now, I really believe this. I think they would be lucky to be a 500 team. They've been uh, really helped 
by the fact that they're playing in a weaker division, the ACC, they basically can dictate their own schedule in the ACC. All right. This year was the first time they played in a conference in the ACC. But look what happened when they went and they played the Southeast Conference teams. A couple of years ago, it was frustrating. Georgia came up uh, to Notre Dame. Georgia never goes past the Mason-Dixon line. Very rarely. And I think I, I was looking up some things. I think they did it like three times in about 60, 70 years. They really stayed within their own. But now they are venturing uh, northward. And they went into South Bend and outplayed Notre Dame that night. And this is a few years ago. All right. And Georgia, they're just getting better. And their other programs are getting better. Alabama, look at how they've improved not just with the football. I mean, that's an institution down there, but even their basketball. Florida, not only have they won in the last 20 years in football under Urban Meyer, but they also won in basketball, back-to-back -back NCAA championships with good players, not great, just played really well in the tournament. Well, I shouldn't say they just played really well in the tournament, but yeah, and I'm not even saying they came out of nowhere, but they're able to recruit. If you're able to recruit two great teams and the two biggest revenue producing sports, I mean, your, your school's big, 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 big time. All right. Florida hasn't really been back to those nice days in, in the early 2000s, but still, what other, what other schools can say that? I was, when I was looking at the national titles, Alabama has won three. BCS national titles, 2009, 11, and 12. And of course, this BCS championship, this is something that's kind of been new in the last 20, you know, 15, 20 years. But just take a look at this. Alabama's won three. Florida's won twice. LSU has won twice. Auburn once. In, in those four schools, you have five, eight championships. The only other team with a multiple championship is Florida State with two. Ohio State's got one, 2002. And I do believe uh, they were in it in 2014. So it's it, it's it's kind of crazy. Overall, the number of championships, Alabama leads with 13. And listen, I'm getting this off Wikipedia, just a list of things. I, I did go to the SEC, and I'll talk about that too. But Alabama, 13 national titles. But here's the deal. In just the 21st century, They've won one, two, three, six national titles. And they're not, and they're no longer doing it via a poll by writers or coaches. They're doing it on the field with these playoffs. Notre Dame, well, you've heard me in years past talk about it. I, I call it the curse of the peacock because they signed a deal in 1990. More power to them. They use something that Oklahoma and Georgia exploited. Uh, in court ruling saying that you could get on TV as much as you want. They uh, basically overrode the powers of where the court system overrode the powers of the NCAA. Make a long story short, these teams and these leagues were free to negotiate their own contracts. Good for them. Good for Notre Dame because basically they've got a lottery every year in terms of the money uh, that's streaming in from NBC. But that being said, it's almost like the curse and that's what I call it, the curse of the peacock, because they win in 88. They don't have the contract in 89. But actually, and here's a great trivia question, their first NBC game with the peacock was Indiana versus Notre Dame at South Bend in 1990. So from 1990 plus one year, they have not sniffed a title. And you can tell me all you want about maybe those two postseasons that they went, but they got bludgeoned. By Clemson, they got bludgeoned by Alabama. We weren't even in the games. It was a travesty. So they have a lot of work to do. And I don't know, and this is what I mean. Uh, are they going to improve to the point where they can take on the SEC powers? Or are they going to have to join? And that's really the second point uh, of the show is what, what this is going to do. Put it this way. With the addition of Texas and Oklahoma, I know Texas A&M was, was absolutely livid 
because now the recruiting becomes even harder for Texas A&M. Interestingly enough, and I didn't take a look at this with Texas, but I couldn't believe this when I saw this. Texas A&M has the largest enrollment of any of the SEC schools. They have over 60,000 kids going to their school. Now, according to, let's say, Wikipedia, I don't know whether that includes undergraduate and graduate, but nevertheless, I, I couldn't believe that Texas A&M had so many students <laughs> enrolled at their school. I mean, that's a monster school. I mean, put it this way. There's only like 30, 35,000 in Alabama. I was really amazed at some of these uh the enrollments at the schools. And of course, Vanderbilt being the only private school right now in the Southeast Conference, they still have 13,000, which is double what Wake or Duke has in the ACC. So you can see where I'm coming from. These schools have quite a bit of boosters and the league is just growing and recruiting becomes, I think, that much easier Maybe not for the individual teams in the Southeast Conference, but definitely for the league itself. Because look at it now. Now you have the SEC basically in the Southwest Conference. They've infiltrated into really, they've really, they got a foothold with Texas A&M, but now they've really planted themselves in two football power states, Oklahoma and Texas. And that's just going to grow. And maybe a Texas kid, maybe at first, yeah, maybe he said, I always wanted to play in the Big 12. But now he gets to play against Oklahoma and against Alabama every year, potentially, to see how good he is and to really get the scouts looking at him and maybe to raise his draft picks. Yeah, maybe you can say, well, if I play in the Big 12, huh. And who knows what the Big 12 is going to be. And that is going to be another thing. Yeah, I'll, get, I'll be able to play. Will he get the same exposure? Not only that, here's the thing. With the recent development saying that kids, you know, college athletes can basically sell themselves and, and be sponsored by different companies. And I saw some guys uh, were really given a, a pretty good kind of corporation or company to uh, – represent while others had let's say the mom and pop barbershop or something nevertheless if players want to say hey listen i want sponsorship where are you going to go southeast conference in my mind it's going to be easier to kind of generate income especially what could potentially happen where you know maybe sponsors actually sponsor a school even to that extent as well, not just give you the Nike logo that you see up here with, with the Army football uh, shirt that I wear, but also maybe Nike goes into other areas just representing these kids. It's uh, the opportunity and potential for these athletes is just through the roof. And it, will it just be a time when let's say the Southeast Conference says, you know what? We're just going to pay the players. And maybe that is what they're envisioning, you know, as they bring in Texas and Oklahoma and they're growing <laughs> this conference. <laughs> Man, I feel sorry for any football coach who is really not weaned on Southeast Conference lore and, and history and all the rest of them to try to come in there and make an impact. <laughs> it's going to be awful difficult. OK, so you have football powerhouses in Alabama. Oklahoma has won seven titles, their last one being in 2000. You have LSU winning four titles. But here's the thing. This is what I like about LSU. And this is the interesting thing. They won once in 1958. But since the 21st century, they've won three times. One was the coaches poll. But they also won outright 2007 and 2019. Meanwhile, here's Notre Dame. Have not won in the 21st century. They have not won in the 2010s or the 2000s. And that's really when the landscape of college football changed with all these uh, schools changing leagues. And as I said, I, I think I was prophetic with this. It's never over the changes 
in the college football landscape. I think there is going to be more changes. I think you are going to see more switches and changes and all the rest of it. I've said, I've mentioned before on previous shows that I can see Gonzaga joining the Big East. I mean, I mean, forget names of conferences. That's just the Big East is, is a name from a marketing standpoint. I mean, it's not much of a Big East when you have teams in Lincoln, Nebraska, or Omaha, Nebraska, and in uh, um, elsewhere in Indiana and, and Wisconsin. I mean, it's Big East if you know you consider the Big East anything <laughs> east of the Rocky Mountains, but. Doesn't really matter. Gonzaga would fit perfectly into the Big East. It would help them in terms of marketing. It would help them in terms of exposure because, yes, they are a national team. And this is what I think Texas and Oklahoma are envisioning, that really maybe the Big 12 was really scrunching, encroaching on their appeal nationally. And here it is. Let's face it. You can say that the SEC is the be-all and end-all league. Proof, take a look. Yes, Texas, their last championship, 2005, that's 16 years ago. That's, it's almost a generation. I mean, that's years, and I mean, you're talking about 2005, 2021, that's 16 years. Basically, is that's four graduating classes when you think about it. It's a long time. Um, Here's the difference. Ready for this? Whereas LSU, and listen, Mississippi State and Mississippi still have, well, they Mississippi State actually won their first national title in anything, but at least they got one. And that was with the baseball program, which they've had a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, program over the last 30 years. Rafael Palmero, Will Clark, Bobby Thigpen. Those are the guys I remember. They graced... Those two guys, the two first basemen, graced the cover of Baseball America. And I'm like, wow, this is a big-time program. They finally won this year. I was glad that they did. You know, I just you like to see teams get over the hump and all the rest of it. Who did they beat? Vanderbilt. So you had two Southeast Conference teams in the College World Series, something that used to be dictated or dominated by teams, as I recall, from USC, Arizona, Arizona State. Um, but he, here's my whole point. The last time Minnesota was ever a player for the national title in football, you got to go back to the year I was born, 1960. Yeah, they were dominant in the early 40s. And one of the, one of the reasons uh, that Notre Dame was so good, or uh, I was even looking, and I knew this, but just for verification, if you take a look at the history of college football, the Ivy Leagues dominated for many reasons. They were basically the first group to really uh, snag college football and have it appeal uh, there. So you had the Harvards, the Yales, and the Princetons winning, each one taking a turn. I think Michigan was the first school outside the Ivy Leagues to finally uh, win the national title. Then the Big Ten, kind of, with Notre Dame. And I'm not saying they were part of the Big Ten, but the Big Ten, Notre Dame, and Army started to dominate the landscape. Army winning in you know, the Warriors, <laughs> we know why that is, because they were able to get all in the good players, <laughs> much like, and, and that's my whole point, much like the Southeast Conference is going to be getting in even more and more and more better players. Um, so Minnesota was a player back in the 40s. They win their last title in 1960. I've never seen Minnesota play in a bowl game. I mean, it's too young for the one where they lost to USC with, with no lights being turned on in, in the twilight of the Rose Bowl. All right, I've never seen Wisconsin. Wisconsin? I don't even think they've won, they've won a national title. Uh, it was only a few years ago when Wisconsin finally got to the Rose Bowl. I mean, you're talking about 20, 25 years. I never saw them in a Rose Bowl, okay? So even all – do you realize this? This is how bad it is for the rest of the country with this move by Texas and Oklahoma. Didn't realize this. Michigan and Auburn have the exact number of national championships. Two. Now, the reason why this is not, I'm not disparaging either school. It's tough to win a national title. But 
Who's the premier team in Alabama? Is it Alabama or Auburn? And who's the premier team? When you think Big Ten, who's the team that you think of first? It's definitely Michigan, and yet they only have two national titles. And one, their last one was 1997, and that was a split vote with Nebraska. Yes, they had an unbelievable season. They beat Oregon in the, the, the Rose Bowl and all the rest of it, but still, 1948, 1997. And this is a school that goes that goes back, you know, to the early late 19th century playing football. Michigan State has got two national titles, 52 in 1965. All right. The reason why, let's say, the Big Ten did so well, and if, if you take a look, even though, let's say, Alabama won a couple of titles and stuff, the SEC kind of was a backseat uh, conference in terms of really, in the minds of everybody, uh, college football because, let's face it, Notre Dame and the Big Ten and the Pac-10, or used to be called the Pac-8, they used to or did recruit black players, particularly from the South. I mean, if you take a look at that Michigan State team from 65 and 66, they're made up of, of great black players, all from the South. Bubba Smith. Uh, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. And how great were they? This is the only time we mentioned this in a past episode on, on Park Ridge Sports History, that Michigan State is still, the it's the only time in the uh, history of the NFL draft where you had four players from the same school taken, I, I think we mentioned in the, in the first nine picks, George Webster, Bubba, Bubba Smith, uh, and a couple other guys, names now uh, elude me, but uh, just thinking off the top of my head, but four players taken, it's never been done before or after in the annals of uh, the NFL draft. That's not happening now. You are seeing more and more players, black and white, whatever, coming from the Southeast Conference. Just going down this list again, uh, Auburn. You have Tennessee with two national titles. Tennessee, last one in 1998. Okay, they're tied with Michigan State, Penn State, Pittsburgh, uh, with the number of titles of two. But here's the deal. Tennessee, last one in 1998. Now, even though that's almost 25 years ago, Penn State hasn't won for over 30 years, 1986. And Pitt hasn't been a player since 1976 with the great Tony Dorsett. And I don't see Pitt doing it anytime soon, nor do I see Penn State because Penn State is up and down in that Big Ten. They really... When they joined back in the 90s, 93, I think, was their first year. Really, they had a comeuppance. Now, they did have a great season in 94. They took, but they've taken some hits in that Big Ten. But if you were to put right now Penn State in the SEC, where would they be? Conversely, if I put Georgia in the Big Ten, they'd probably be dominating the East or the West Conference, whichever one they they were put in every year. I'm just going through this. I was looking. Georgia has only won one national title. I was really surprised when they beat Notre Dame. But who was the great? Herschel Walker was on that team. 150-some-odd yards. Played from uh, midway through the first period. Uh, the entire game with a separated shoulder. Notre Dame knew it. Notre Dame was beating the heck out of them. And the quarterback, Buck Blue, didn't help Herschel Walker out at all. He didn't complete a pass until late in the game. And still, Georgia was able to hold off the Irish and beat them 17-10 for their first and only national title. Interestingly enough, Georgia Tech was an original member and uh, of the ACC, uh, excuse me, of the Big Ten, and they left. They won one, though, 30 years ago. Uh, when they were part of the ACC, but I'm just I, I'm I'm just looking at 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 some of these, and it, it's just amazing to me how few. Okay, how few these teams uh, have done now. 
Here's what I think is going to happen. And I think what is going to happen, you may see, and I was just going through some of the things. You may see, put it this way. Here's what I mean. Since 2000, and I'm getting this off Wikipedia, all right? You had Oklahoma and Miami basically share the national title. Miami wins it in 2001. Ohio State beats Miami, but they, quote, unquote, share it with USC. Although I think most people say Ohio State won the national title. In fact, that's the year Trestle beats Miami in the uh, title game. LSU is 13-1 uh, and one with Nick Saban. Now, I'm just giving you all the coaches' polls. So LSU, Oklahoma, USC. But see, there's a pattern there. USC. 2004, 2005, it's Texas. It's the last time they won it. 2006, Florida and quote unquote Ohio State. LSU in 2007, 2008, Florida with Urban Meyer leading again the Gators. Alabama, Auburn, Alabama, Alabama. They drilled Notre Dame in that 2012 championship. Notre Dame wasn't even in the game. They were down 7 nothing before they even knew what, what hit them. Florida State, 2013. 2014, Ohio State. I think the SEC took a couple of years off to reload, I guess. Then it was Alabama and Clemson. Alabama, Clemson, LSU, Alabama. Now, of course, I'm just giving you a list. These are the polls that they had, and uh, but you can see that – no other, really, in the last five, six years, it's a Southern team, mostly from the Southeast Conference. Uh, the Southeast Conference, this is how good they are, that the really the networks are worried each year that they're going to get all, an all-SEC. It can't happen, but they're so worried with so many of the Final Four teams being comprised of SEC teams. They're so worried about the ratings and uh, – you know, they want regionalization in East, the West, the South, a North type of situation. The SEC doesn't comply because they're just so, so good. But anyway, here's what I was thinking is going to eventually happen. I actually believe this, that you may just see one league and you might just see one league comprised of all, let's say, big-time playing schools. And they may be given a professional status because maybe through sponsorship, through these kids making their own deals, maybe the NCAA comes up with something and says, we're going to give them, quote, unquote, a stipend or a salary to play. If that happens, I really think that you're not going to see 136 teams, quote, unquote, vying for a national title or a place in the four for the postseason. As it is right now, you have, you know, you have the power five, and then they come across if a Boise State has an undefeated season. Sometimes they throw them a bone and allow them to come in. And, of course, uh, the postseason is going to expand a little bit, giving maybe those teams an extra crumb at the table. That being said, I actually think this is what's going to happen. And listen, I've been wrong before. I'll be wrong again. But just, just hear me out on this. With the Southeast Conference expanding with those two Big 12, it's really, what does the Big 12 have left? It's really no longer a football conference. It's really a basketball conference with Kansas and Baylor being the preeminent teams, maybe in Iowa State. So they will probably, the Big 12 will probably reach out. They'll probably extend maybe an invite to Houston. Maybe they'll even do a radical thing by expanding and reaching out to get Temple. So there falls the AAC. Okay. Um, you bring in those kind of schools for the Big 12, doesn't make them better, but at least it keeps that conference together. 
But here's the radical idea I think is going to happen. I think you're going to see within the next five, six years, as this SEC drama unfolds, and as you see the SEC dominate more of the college sports, we haven't gotten into basketball. I mean, basically it's Kentucky that has won all the championships in the SEC. But mind you, they've actually, uh, the big basketball powerhouses in the Big Ten haven't won in about 30 years. You're talking about Indiana. Their last championship was 1987. Ohio State hasn't won since 1960. Michigan, 1989. And I was floored by this. I couldn't believe this. I double-checked this. Michigan State has won two titles, one in 79, the great Irving Johnson versus Larry Bird. But they've only won in 2000 on their Izzo. I mean, they've gotten there. seems like they're there every year in the Final Four. But yet they've only won one title. So here's what I'm projecting. I think what you're going to see is an expansion of the teams. I'm just going to read them to you. And I think that you're going to see eventually one big league comprised of USC, UCLA, Nebraska, Stanford, Oregon. Why Oregon? Nike. You're going to see the all the Southeast Conference teams. I can see the Southeast Conference extending invites and saying, we're going to make a mega league. But we're going to keep all the original team or all of the set teams in the SEC. And we're going to extend invites to Michigan and Ohio State. Maybe Rutgers because they'd want that Eastern marketing. Miami of Florida. UNC. Basketball. Think basketball. Notre Dame. Syracuse. Upper New York. Plus it's a basketball institution. Clemson. The football power. Wisconsin. Kansas. Michigan State, I'm even going to say, let's say throw Louisville in there. So you're talking about this. Um, I could see them extending another five, seven, eight, and probably another 16 invites. And it won't be called the Southeast Conference. It'll just be called the Mega League. And they will play football and basketball. And they will leave behind the rest of these conference and it will almost be a Tier 1, Division 1 football and basketball. Or they may just do Division 1 football and the others play, let's say, in the weaker bowl games or in the lesser bowl games, which is why I think Notre Dame will be involved in this. But I think that the Southeast Conference expansion is just the beginning of a mega league that the Southeast Conference is going to unleash on the on the landscape of college football in particular and the NCAA. And we can talk about this in the future too. This is Will O'Toole for Park Ridge Sports History. Thank you again for allowing me into your homes and talking all things sports. See you next week.